And so now to start our conversation about our accountability as Leadership Fort Worth and as community trustees, Lawrence Epps is going to come to um, give us a framework and some context for um, better understanding the call for racial justice and equity. So Lawrence, thank you. Thank you, Harry. Much appreciated. And thanks to the uh, 80 plus of you who are not on the staff uh, who've chosen to be here with us tonight. We appreciate you being here. So as Harry mentioned, I want to use this to try to give a bit of context to the topic. And hopefully in doing that, I'm also going to give you some food for thought and hopefully what also will translate into some action on the part of everybody to get engaged in this window of opportunity that we find ourselves in. So as Doug mentioned, we're in a, we're in a unique position. He talked a little bit about the uh, coronavirus. Um, and I look today, we're up to, I wanna say seven, a little over seven million cases confirmed worldwide, um, you know, 400, thousand deaths worldwide, and I think in the U.S. it's around two million cases and around 115,000 and counting in terms of people who have perished from this thing. And in the midst of all of that and all of the changes in our lives that that has brought with it, we also find ourselves dealing with um, a, something that's been pent up in this country for a number of years and is now manifested itself in people taking to the streets for the last 17 days after uh, George Floyd's murder uh, that we all witnessed uh, on camera. So it, it's, a, it's a different time, it's unique, it brings a lot of challenges. And with that, I think there also come opportunities. I hesitated to do this, but I tried to touch on, there's no way to do this justice, but these are like 20, what I think of as 20 inflection points in black history in America. You know, going back 401 years since the first slave ship landed at Jamestown, the Emancipation Proclamation and 13th Amendments trying to address slavery, integration and education trying to be addressed through Brown versus Board of Education, uh, Emmett Till's murder, uh, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Rodney King, probably the first manifestation of video being used to document police misconduct, being beaten by uh, a gang of police officers in, on the streets of Los Angeles. 12 years since Barack Obama's election as the nation's 44th president and first black president. Eight years since Trayvon Martin was killed for being a teenager, wearing a hoodie and walking through his neighborhood. Seven years since Black Lives Matter was launched as a result of Trayvon Martin's killer not being convicted by a jury in Florida. Six years since Eric Garner was killed on the streets of New York for selling cigarettes. Tamir Rice was killed in a park for playing with a gun, a toy gun. Four years since Sandra Bland didn't give a turn signal to change lanes and was arrested and subsequently killed in South Texas. Four years since Colin Kaepernick was vilified for taking the advice of a Green Beret to kneel during the national anthem in protest of police brutality. Eight months since Brotham John and Tatiana Jefferson were murdered four months since Ahmaud Arbery was murdered for jogging, three months since Breonna Taylor was murdered in her home because police executed a no-knock warrant in the middle of the night at the wrong house, 17 days since we all witnessed George Floyd's murder. So that brings us to now. And what we see now is Black Lives, movement, Black Lives Matter has literally become a global movement. Upper left, you see a picture of protests that happened in Fort Worth. They're ongoing every night. Upper right, people took to the streets and continue to take to the streets in Paris, France. And down below, you see a map 
with blue dots indicating where protests have taken place in the name of Black Lives Matter and in reaction to George Floyd's murder all around the world. Wow. So to get a picture of maybe why this is such an inflection point for the nation, particularly for Black people, this piece, uh, I think, from PBS, from a, a journalist and, a, and a, uh, an author, gives us some insight into how what we're experiencing through corona actually gives a glimpse of what poor Black communities especially feel every day. So I ask you to take a minute to take a look at this. As curfews in many cities are about to begin again tonight, we're at a place where we don't need to go searching past events and expert opinions in order to understand the protests around the killing of George Floyd. We can analyze it first person. Tonight, journalist and author Dawn Turner shares her humble opinion on why we all need to make a connection between the pandemic and the protests. When I was a columnist for the Chicago Tribune, I often wrote about race in poor African-American communities. Many times, well-meaning white readers would ask me, what can I do? I want you to know that this pandemic has afforded you a vantage point like none other. This is your opportunity to know what people who live in poor communities face and feel every day, long before COVID. I want you to remember what it feels like to stand in long lines to enter stores. Because in poor Black communities, some merchants, fearing theft from a few bad apples, have long restricted the number of people they allow in at one time. And those plexiglass dividers that protect store workers now, well, their bulletproof cousins have been mounted in stores in Black communities for ages. I want you to remember the knot of anxiety you feel wondering whether there will be enough eggs or meat or even toilet paper on store shelves. Poor people living in food deserts face scarcity all the time. I want you to remember the unease of walking past boarded up businesses and jogging down barren streets because that's what poor people who live in white communities experience every day. I want you to remember what it feels like to have to hole up in your house because the world beyond your door is dangerous and filled with people who could cost you your life. I want you to remember what it feels like to lose your job and not only to be stripped of vital income and all that entails, but of purpose and those connections that motivate and inspire us. I want you to remember how it feels to have to stand in line to ask for a handout and how you worry that people will ask you, how did you get yourself in this situation? If you take away nothing else from this pandemic, I want you to remember how powerless and hopeless and disaffected this moment has rendered you. I want you to realize that for poor Black people, this is not a moment. If this pandemic offers even a smidgen of empathy, then maybe you understand why people might rise up and rage. So big props to Dawn for um, connecting those dots. I think that's an important connection for everybody to keep in mind as we continue to go through this. Um, systemic racism, which is what we live with in our society, is multi-layered. And this graphic tries to lay it out into four layers. The first being personal, where private beliefs, prejudices, and ideas that individuals have, um, some taught to them, some passed down through assumptions, some passed down through misguided and misinformation in, in the form of history that's been uh, twisted or turned into uh, stories that are much more flattering than they probably should be, but nonetheless, those things land at a personal level. Then you have the interpersonal, where there are expressions of racism between individuals, sometimes explicit, sometimes intentional, brutally uh, aimed at trying to cause hurt, other times uh, subliminal, subtle, not meant to really offend or hurt anybody, just didn't know any better. Then you have the institutional, where discriminatory treatment policies and practices live 
and continue to move on within organizations and institutions without being addressed. And finally, you have the structural, where, you, where systems and public policies and institutional practices actually perpetuate racial inequality. We all see, live and in color, as recently as yesterday, a blatant example of it in the state of Georgia where people had to wait in line, in some cases, six, seven hours to vote in a primary. It's like watching a warm up for what's headed our way in just a few months. It's not just policing and it's not just um, law enforcement. There's a lot of other indicators that we live with and see every day. The racial divide, this is a study done by the Institute for Policy Studies looking at wealth, uh, net worth, median net worth by race. And what you can see is over that 30 year period between 1983 and 2016, wealth among white families went from 110,000 to 147,000, uh, growing by 30 plus percent. Well, that same uh, wealth among black families was cut in half in that same period of time. Now, a lot of this is connected to uh, property ownership and things that are handed down over time. It's also connected to policies that followed slavery in the form of Jim Crow laws, et cetera, that reduced the opportunity for black people to own property and subsequently not have the opportunity to pass it down. In health, we live with it. Black infant mortality is over twice the rate of white infants. One study found that 67% of doctors have either conscious or unconscious bias against African-American patients. This shows up in how they treat those patients, in how they prescribe medication, the assumptions they make about those patients, et cetera. <coughs> Excuse me. In addition, COVID-19 has revealed for everyone that the inequalities or inequities in our healthcare system have shown up where black people have died from COVID-19 at twice the rate of other races. Criminal justice, while only making up 13% of the general population, blacks make up 40% of the prison population in a country that imprisons more people than any other country in the world. Black drivers are 30% more likely to be pulled over and black people are more likely to be killed, three times more likely to be killed by police in their lifetime than white people. These are about 54 of the faces in recent times that have suffered from criminal injustice in this country. These people had, they have parents, they have siblings, they have children, they have neighbors, they have friends that they'll never get to come back to as a result of this. So hopefully we are now living in what will be looked back upon as America's tipping point. That's a question. I hope we all believe that the time has come for serious dialogue and most importantly, action. So here's where we come in. We in Leadership Fort Worth have used a model of community trusteeship to convey what we hope we want to stand for in the community. It calls for us to listen, care, and lead in a distinctive way that's focused on the needs of the many, that looks at success as measured by how much better things become for the least of us. So with that in mind, it's our opportunity, it's our time in this unique window that we have today to use this influence to try to make a difference. There's two thoughts I wanna leave you with. One is that kids aren't born racist. There's no racist gene. It's literally something that has to be trained. They have to be trained and taught to do. So if no other place on, in, in our lifetimes or in our lives, we have a chance to influence that. And if we can, if we can change that, which I think we're seeing evidence of, quite frankly, in the way we see these kids out protesting today. But we need to keep that up. The other thought is a quote from Angela Davis, that in a racist society such as we live in, it's not enough to be non-racist. 
It's not, well, I'm not a racist. That's not good enough. We have to become anti-racist. Nobody would settle for non-Nazi. So let's not settle for non-racist. Let's become anti-racist. That's the call of action. So with that, I will turn it over to Harriet. And Harriet, I know I butchered my time, but we're there. Well, thank you, Lawrence. That was important. And I appreciate the chance for us to have uh, learned that from you.